Today, let's explore the top seven foods that can help with kidney healing. But first, let's address some misconceptions about the kidney diet. The right diet depends on your specific stage of kidney disease and desired outcomes. The common kidney diet suggestions focus on restricting certain nutrients to limit damage in advanced stages. However, for healing purposes, we aim to repair and rejuvenate the kidneys to restore their original function. Kidney disease is categorized into five stages, with stage three further divided into A and B based on creatinine levels. The kidneys filter large amounts of water daily, removing dissolved substances like sodium, glucose, and creatinine. While glucose and sodium are mostly reabsorbed, creatinine is not. Elevated creatinine levels indicate reduced kidney filtration and insufficient fluid passing through. This is measured as the estimated glomerular filtration rate, calculated based on creatinine levels. A rate of 90 milliliters or more suggests normal function or a stage 1 kidney issue unrelated to filtration volume, possibly due to protein in the urine or similar findings. Filtering more than 60 but less than 90 puts you at stage 2, which is ironically considered normal on a blood test. Stages 1 and 2 are within the normal range because the cutoff is usually at 60. Stage 3A goes down to 45 and 3B reaches down to 30 milliliters. Stage 4 ranges between 15 and 30, and if it falls below 15, you're in stage 5, or end-stage renal disease, where dialysis or a transplant are your only options. Approximately 15% of the population experiences some degree of kidney compromise, fitting into these stages. That's roughly 1 in 7 worldwide. 1% of this 15 is in stage 5. Including stage 4, that's 3% which means less than 1% of the total population really needs to be extra cautious, strictly adhering to guidelines and avoiding various things. Stage 1 doesn't really face this issue. They don't need to avoid anything. Stage 2 also has no restrictions related to the standard kidney diet. They need to address the root cause, which we'll delve into. That accounts for about 50% of people with kidney compromise. Stage 3A is twice as common as 3B, meaning about 20% of people with kidney problems need to be alert. Stages 5 and 4 need to be especially vigilant, but stage 3B isn't off the hook. They need to limit and be cautious with certain things. However, for the rest, around 80% of those with kidney disease, the kidney diet isn't applicable since it's about restricting things that the failing kidney can't eliminate. Only about 20% of people face this issue, while 80% don't. With stage 5 kidney disease, when EGFR falls below 15, significant damage has occurred. These individuals must consult a nephrologist immediately if they haven't already. Their diet requires the utmost restriction, limiting virtually everything. Sodium, potassium, phosphorus, nitrogen, a protein byproduct, and even potentially water. If kidney filtration is this poor, every consumed substance must be scrutinized. Here's the rub. Do these restrictions cause chronic kidney disease? There lies a massive misunderstanding. Just because individuals with kidney failure need to avoid these elements doesn't indicate they are the culprits. Rather, these are resources our bodies require. Healthy individuals need minerals, protein, and water to avoid getting sick. Those with mild cases need these nutrients to facilitate recovery. So we need to establish this clearly because often we fall into the trap of thinking if we limit these when the kidney is impaired, they must be the cause. That's far from the truth. We need these elements to promote healing. Prevention is the key here, of course. Adopting lifestyle changes before ever reaching this point is crucial. Your kidneys deserve the best, and we're here to guide you every step of the way. These are the seven superfoods. Number one is cauliflower which holds a special place in my heart when it comes to delicious and nutritious food. Often it's praised for its low potassium levels and high amounts of vitamin C and fiber. But is that all true? Let's do some fact-checking. While it's indeed low in phosphorus, its potassium content comes in at 299, a figure that I wouldn't label as low. However, I'd like to emphasize that this isn't a bad thing. In fact, for most of us in good health, potassium is something we actively seek, and cauliflower serves as a superb supplier. A content of 299 isn't too shabby at all. What makes it even better is that cauliflower, being a light-on-the-carbs and water-rich food, allows us to eat more of it, opening the door to an abundance of potassium. Enjoy it as a small side and you're set. 
But we'll have to attach a slight caveat here, represented by a little question mark. What does this mean, you ask? It simply suggests that the potassium content can be high, depending on the quantity you eat. Let's consider a scenario where you whip up some cauliflower mash as a hearty alternative to mashed potatoes. If you belong to groups 3, B, 4, or 5, which require a potassium intake restriction, eating a pound of cauliflower, not a daunting task, especially when steamed and water squeezed out, could expose you to about 1,500 milligrams of potassium. Does this sound alarming? Let's unpack that further. People with stage 3 and 4 kidney disease are dealing with moderate to severe damage. Advice typically suggests sodium intake should be less than 2,000 and phosphorus less than 1,000. As for protein, a range of 60 to 80 is recommended, skewing more towards the lower end, especially for stage 4. But why are we particularly interested in potassium? Because an excess buildup of it could decelerate your heart, or in dire situations, even stop it completely. That's a scenario we should definitely strive to evade. In stage 3A of kidney disease, you're still filtering well enough to handle potassium. For stage 3B, potassium should ideally be kept below 3,000 mg, and for stage 4, the limit drops to less than 2,000 mg. So, if you're exploring a keto diet to rejuvenate your kidneys, eating heaps of cauliflower might breach those limits, especially when combined with other foods in your diet. However, don't lose heart if you're already dealing with kidney damage. Remember, there's a beacon of hope flickering in the darkness. Our kidneys still hold a significant capacity to regenerate if we just start making healthier choices. Garlic grabs the number two spot, praised for its possible anti-inflammatory and antioxidant perks. This potent herb indeed packs a punch. Feel free to use it liberally for an array of health benefits. Mind you, despite the impressive amounts of phosphorus, potassium, and near absence of sodium sugar, you won't be munching on garlic by the pound. Even if you consume a whole bulb, the potassium levels won't cause issues. Bell pepper takes the number three slot. It's celebrated for its low potassium content and generous dose of vitamins A and C. Red and green variants show slight differences, particularly in potassium levels which might edge a tad high in large amounts. Love them in your stir-fry or fajitas. No biggie. But if bell pepper dominates your plate, you might want to be cautious. If you're on a low-potassium diet, green bell peppers could be a better choice. However, it depends on your portion size. For most of us, bell peppers are probably okay. But let's place a question mark just in case. Moving on to the fourth, we have delightful berries, noted for being low in potassium and a great provider of vitamin C and fiber. These tasty treats boast pretty similar and favorable nutritional stats, from raspberries to strawberries. If you're on a mission to combat insulin resistance with a low-carb or ketogenic diet, berries make an excellent ally. A handful a day keeps your health worries away. But if you're sampling a strawberry for each one you pick at a farm, then the sugar and potassium might get a bit much. Egg whites sit at number five, hailed as a low-phosphorus source of high-quality protein. However, the story isn't that simple. Whole eggs, which pair the white and yolk, offer a more balanced nutrition profile. However, the phosphorus content might be of concern. If you're dealing with advanced kidney issues, egg whites might be the safer option. Yet remember, the whole egg, yolk included, is an unrivaled source of protein, second only to mother's milk. Stripping away the yolk reduces protein absorption to about a third. Therefore, for most people, eating the whole egg is the way to go. Let's put a tentative question mark here too, especially for those following a ketogenic diet to heal kidneys or reverse diabetes. If you're guzzling down more than a dozen eggs daily, the phosphorus content might creep too high. So limiting yourself to two to four eggs might be a more balanced approach. Number six, olive oil. It's no secret that it's packed with heart-friendly, monounsaturated fats, a fact I firmly stand by. I'd suggest going for extra virgin olive oil, preferably organic. It's not too hard on the wallet these days. Despite containing scant amounts of minerals like phosphorus, potassium, and sodium, nearly zero to one, olive oil holds a secret that often goes misunderstood. Contrary to popular belief, olive oil, a plant or fruit oil if we're being precise, comprises 16% saturated fatty acids and a whopping 74% monounsaturated fatty acids. 
It's usually compared to other plant oils and dubbed healthy, along with every other vegetable oil on the supermarket shelves. Yet the truth is, the fat composition of extra virgin olive oil aligns more closely with that of beef fat than other plant oils. Beef boasts a substantial 42% of heart-beneficial monounsaturated fats, with a higher concentration of saturated fats, being a solid animal-derived fat. Similar to us humans, animals store fat this way too. They too have a considerable amount of monounsaturated fats, something other plant oils lack in. Hence, beef fat and olive oil share a closer relationship than olive oil does with other plant oils. All things considered, olive oil definitely earns a thumbs up from me. Drizzle it generously on your meals. Moving on to the seventh entry, skinless chicken, known for being low in phosphorus and high in protein. The levels of these nutrients in skinless chicken aren't remarkably low, but are somewhat manageable. Due to its dense nature, you won't eat as much of it compared to more water-rich food. However, have you ever wondered why you would opt for skinless chicken over a whole chicken unless you're deliberately seeking a blander taste? The whole chicken carries more fat, which is why many suggest the skinless variant. But interestingly, the key nutrients we're monitoring, phosphorus and potassium, are found in lower quantities in the whole chicken. Moreover, thanks to its higher fat content, the whole chicken leaves you feeling more satiated. Thus, you're likely to eat less, helping you regulate nutrient levels even better. In essence, chicken can be a part of your diet, with its consumption quantity being the deciding factor. Thank you for watching.